I knew my marriage was in trouble when my wife started growing distance and preferring to volunteer her free time to people with substance abuse problems than to spend her free time with me. Our youngest daughter just moved out to college and we are now realizing that the only thing that held us together were our children. The only time we seem to spend time together is when we are watching football on Sunday because we are Green Bay fans and when we go to bed at night, she now spends most of her free time doing volunteer work. Previously, we used to volunteer together and it wasn't political or ideological, but everything changed after the 2016 election. After Trump got elected, she became politically active and ultra altruistic. She started believing that every underprivileged group could do no wrong. Illegal immigrants are innocent and the border wall are provocative to them. People in prisons are victims of their environment and the lack of opportunity is the reason why they are in prison. Every minority group is oppressed and etc. This almost happened at the flip of a switch. I am really not political and it wasn't something that we really cared about prior. So I no longer recognize that woman that I fell in love with 23 years ago. She gave me a shock of my life when I caught her in bed with a younger man with a felony record for crimes that span the state. Let me give a context to my story. I am a 44 year old man and my wife is 44 as well. We have two children together, a 21 year old and a 19 year old. My wife was born in California. She moved to Arizona to attend college. We met in college. I was studying business finance and she was starting to be a teacher. She loved children and wanted to work with children. The reason I fell in love with her was because she was a selfless person that enjoys helping people. After we graduated college, we got married. I got a job at a bank and she became an elementary school teacher. For the entirety of our marriage, I was the breadwinner. Her job as an elementary school teacher was nothing more than a charity work and something that made her happy because it provided no financial contribution to our household. After the 2016 general election, we became disgusted by the election of Donald Trump. There was nothing I could do about it and I left it there, but she went further. She started attending protests, started becoming more active in local and district elections. She even attended the Women's March in January 2017 in Washington. All she wanted to talk about was politics and I was indifferent. I noticed that a wedge was growing between us because she was becoming more interested in things that I am not. She joined politically active groups including LGBTQ and women's rights groups and she started making like-minded friends. In February 2017, she started working with a local group that helped rehabilitate alcohol and substance abusers and serving in soup kitchens and helping them find jobs. Our kids were not home anymore and she wasn't making dinner or doing chores like she used to. She would spend her weekend at the community center. I spoke to her about us not spending enough time together. I can't possibly spend 12 hours at work every day then come home to an empty refrigerator and a dirty house. I told her that I recognized her need to help people, but I reminded her that our relationship and our household is suffering in that process. She felt offended that I didn't want her to spend as much time as she was spending with strangers. She would go on a rant about how privileged we are and there are people out there who need our help. I reminded her that she is privileged because I work hard to pay for everything and the least she could do is to spend time with me instead of complaining that I am privileged. If I wasn't hard at work but instead spending time with substance abusers, then she can bet that she wouldn't have anybody to buy her a house or a car or all the nice things that made her feel privileged. She went on about how money is not everything. I told her that it was easy for her to say because I'm the only one contributing to the household. That sort of argument created further rift in our relationship. After that day, she refused to sleep in the same bed with me. 
She started sleeping in another one of our bedrooms. Sometimes she ignores me and won't speak to me unless she wants something. It was almost like we were roommates. She shot down every attempt I made to reconcile. For whatever reason, she thought I offended her. After a few weeks of her not wanting to spend time or sleep in the same room with me, I began to accept the reality of my situation. I didn't want to go through divorce because she would take half of all that I have worked for for the last 21 years. I just stayed in the marriage, hoping that everything would get better. August 4th, 2017. I will always remember that day. It was a Friday and I just finished a meeting with my direct reports and I was heading to my office when my secretary informed me that a process server dropped something up for me. I could see by the look on her face that something wasn't right. When I looked at the paper, it appears that my wife had sent the process server to serve me at work. It was completely unnecessary for her to embarrass me at work. I felt like I have done nothing to deserve such treatment. I called her several times and she didn't respond. While I was driving home, I called my oldest son and told him what was going on with his mom. When I got home, I was irate and we got into a heated argument about the divorce. She accused me of trying to turn the kids against her. She accused me of being a monster and that I was hateful and didn't care about anybody but myself and that her eyes have recently opened about how cruel I was. It was so frustrating to listen to half the stuff she was saying. She told me that the marriage is over and all she wanted to talk to me about was how much I owe her and what she deserved. That really flipped a switch in me and I slapped her. I was hoping that it would snap her back to her senses. She went into the room, locked the door and called the police. The next thing I know, the police showed up on my door and I was asked to leave the house for 24 hours. The following day, I hired a divorce lawyer. When I went back home to take my stuff, she served me with a temporary restraining order as if I was an abuser. My lawyer told me to find somewhere else to stay temporarily till the divorce is finalized. I agreed and took most of my stuff out the house and rented a motel. Two days later, I decided to go back home and get some clothing that I forgot. When I got to my house, my soon-to-be ex-wife was home. I sneaked in through the back door and was quietly heading to my room when I suddenly heard some moaning coming from my room. Realizing what was going on, I ran to the room and saw my wife being intimate with a younger man. I was in shock. I turned on my camera phone and started recording them. My soon-to-be ex-wife covered herself. The young man started putting his clothes on slowly. He had no fear, no shame, and wasn't even rushing to cover himself. I instigated a fight with him. Even though he was bigger than me, I managed to overpower him. I hit him with everything that I could get my hands on. My soon-to-be ex-wife started yelling at me, accusing me of breaking and entering in my own home and threatening to call the cops on me. Turns out that the guy she was sleeping with was a drug addict who was jailed in Coconino County and had at least three prior felony convictions for crimes that spanned the state. After finding out that she was sleeping with another man before the divorce is finalized, I realized that she may have been having an affair with the felon all along, which might be the reason why she has been acting irrational. Any hope of reconciliation was out the door. The divorce not only hit my wallet hard, it affected me emotionally and got me into drinking. Maybe if I was a drug addict or an alcoholic, I would be a victim enough for her to care about me. After the divorce, she got my house in the divorce settlement and I had to pay her a sum of $2,266.67 per month for five years in alimony. And to add insults to injury, I had to pay her lawyer's fees as well. I don't want to go into details about my kids, but they were on my side. About a few weeks later, when the divorce was being finalized and I was already living in my own apartment, I was no longer in contact with my ex-wife and I found out from my kids that she allowed her drug addict boyfriend to move in with her. There's nothing worse than knowing that another man is enjoying the fruit of your labor. I had to move on and start over. 
few weeks later, I received a call from my daughter that her mom was not answering her phone. That was the first time I knew something was wrong. In October 2017, a missing persons report was filed and I was called into the police station for interrogation. I brought my lawyer with me so I wouldn't incriminate myself. My alibi checked out and I was let go. Although I was still the prime suspect, the police later found out that my ex-wife boyfriend recently went to jail and she put up our home as collateral to bail him out of prison. Turns out that the man she was sleeping with was a 31-year-old substance abuser who was jailed in Coconino County and had at least three prior convictions for crimes that spanned the state and he was nowhere to be found for questioning. So they weren't sure if he was a suspect or a victim. There was a community-wide search for her and I refused to join the search, which in hindsight made me appear as a suspect. We later received the news that my ex-wife boyfriend was stopped by a traffic police while driving her blood-stained car. He was arrested and interrogated. Come to find out she had bailed him out of jail recently by putting up the house she got in a divorce settlement as collateral. He stabbed her multiple times and he ran her over with her own car because she was trying to set boundaries to ensure that he sought help for substance abuse and to get a job. During her funeral, her sister was quoted as saying that she had this flawed belief that anybody could be rescued with enough kindness and compassion. And why that serves the kid she thought and the underprivileged she advocates for. Unfortunately, with her murderer, it cost her her life.